do it. It's go time. Hello, and welcome to go time. Today, we are going to be talking about who owns your code. A question that certainly has been on my mind. So we're going to be exploring who owns the code. The company? Is it the engineer? Is it the team? Is it all of the open source contributors if it's a project? How about when you're using AI, machine learning, GitHub Copilot? Is it still your code? I'm really excited. We have a really brilliant guest with us today. We have Lewis Via, who is a programmer turned attorney who has been involved in open source since college. He's worked at Mozilla, where he revised the Mozilla public license at Wikimedia Foundation, where he also briefly led the community team. And as a lawyer, he's worked with Google, Amazon, and many other small startups. So currently he's the co-founder at Tide Lift, which works to make open source better for everyone by paying maintainers. Wanna hear more about that? Um, but before that, I'd like to introduce our co-hosts. We have Chris. Hi, Chris. I haven't seen you in a hot second. Hello. I am back after a very, very long but much needed break. So I'm feeling rested and I'm, I'm ready to uh, get some get into the meta of this uh, who owns code. It's going to be I'm fun. Ready. You're ready. I'm ready. It's a very interesting topic. And the beautiful Natalie. I've seen you, I think, far too often for your own liking um, <laughs> in recent weeks. My it's like our weekly one on one, but it's not one on one. Uh, weekly one-on-one -on -one with anyone who decides to tune into the live. <laughs> weekly anyone, I like that. Yeah, weekly anyone. Beautiful. Me and Natalie don't do one-on-ones, we do anyone's. <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, Lewis, would love to hear a little bit more uh, about you and your thoughts on code ownership. Well, you know, I immediately went to... So, I, it's been a long time since I wrote anything approaching useful code, right? Um, but I've been involved, I, I had an interviewer ask me while I was interviewing for my first law school job out of out of uh, law school, and law firm job out of law school. And they said, well, why, you seem to really like tech. Why did you leave tech? And I said, look, I'm not leaving tech. Like I am only interviewing with law firms that are very much tech forward, tech first kind of law firms, right? So the goal was never to leave tech, the goal was I was at a startup, uh, open source, back in the first year of the Linux desktop, um, I was uh, at a small startup. We got acquired during that acquisition process. I worked with the attorneys and I was like, oh, I bet I could, I was, I was arrogant. <laughs> um, I was young. Uh, I was like, oh, I can do a better job than these people. And um, so I decided after a little bit of experimenting and I took like a night school law class that I enjoyed, a couple of night school law classes that I enjoyed. And so I, uh, so I, I, I um, decided to go to law school, right? But the goal was always all along to continue to focus on tech and specifically very much to focus on open law because there, there seemed to me at the time to be a, um, a body of lawyers who were sophisticated about technology, but they came at it very much from a patent first, uh, control first kind of mindset. And that was something that was already starting to break down at the time. So I was in law school 2006, 2009. And um, there was beginning to be an understanding amongst legal academics that this was, that open was a thing, right? Um, I had attended a conference of legal academics where Creative Commons was announced. Uh, that was 2002. Uh, or no, that, that was 2001, basically. And uh, so there were some legal academics who got it, right? And in fact, I pretty only only applied to law schools that had at least one faculty member who had written something that indicated that they got it in the slightest amount. So that meant applications were easier because there wasn't that many schools to apply to. And, uh, you know, and I think that was that has worked out well right it's been a good career it's been a fun career right because i very much um you know the point was not uh, that that oh i can like make my piles of money and work three thousand hours a, a year or whatever it was 
I have friends who are open lawyers who deserve better lawyering than the lawyering that they were getting at the time. And I think that's been that that sense of, hey, I'm doing this to help open people get better lawyering has served me well as a sort of motto and mission um, and has led to a lot of fun outcomes, right? I mean, because open people are doing a lot of fun projects, have been doing a lot of fun projects, and that hasn't changed. Uh, and I certainly don't think it's going to change anytime soon. But a lot of it does come back to this question of, like, who owns the thing, right? And, and I admit I have enough lawyer brainworms at this point that my immediate thought goes to, like, okay, well, the contract of the... And then one of you during, during the top prep said, well, you know, well, what about, like, team ownership? And I was like, oh, right. You know, to fall, there's this, we talk in law school about this analogy that uh, ownership is, for for reasons I don't remember or maybe never knew, we talk about ownership being a bundle of sticks. And the idea is that we sort of, we talk about it as if it's like one big trunk, but it's actually like a lot of different small things, right? And ownership in the code world is very fragmented because there's a sense of like, well, okay, you know, for almost all of you, if you are working for a company, at the end of the day, uh, your company owns the code that you are writing, at least on the company time, as long as you're, unless you're very careful to like, not do it on company time, not do it on company hardware, uh, and to do it in areas that are unrelated to what the company is working on. If you're doing those things and you keep it, but otherwise, as a general rule of thumb, the company owns it. So that's like the sort of lawyer brain answer. Like, well, yeah, okay, we're done here. You know, it's been a nice podcast. Glad to talk to you all. Um, but there's very much, of course, all these fractal little senses of, well, okay, but what does it mean when the team, you know, team versus individual ownership? Uh, because in some, like in a lawyerly sense, like the company is the one who can sell it, but who has responsibility for it within the company? Like that's not a legal question. That's a... That's a team norms, team behaviors kind of question. And there's also these questions of what exactly is it that you own, right? Because I spent several years of my career, I am a, uh, what we call a transactional lawyer. Like basically I do contracts. If the contract goes wrong for some reason, that is somebody else's problem to argue about it in court. Uh, and so I've only ever been to court uh, for work once, uh, which was a little case uh, called Oracle v. Google. And you might have heard of that one. And the question at some level was about who owns or can anyone own the idea of an API, right? And that's probably not something you're thinking about too much in your day-to-day, -day, right? And your, comp and your corporate lawyers probably aren't most of the time either. They're not thinking about who owns the API. They're just thinking about like this file, right? Or this binary that we're distributing or these days often this SaaS that we're putting out over the internet, you know, your customers never actually see code except for whatever's JavaScripted or wasmed or whatever. But, um, you know, and of course that's a whole nother thing. Anyway, I mean, it's just fractal and we could talk about it for way more than an hour, but that's sort of my like 10,000 foot overview is that it's, there's both this ownership in the legal sense, but very much also in the code and culture sense uh, and we can talk about any or all of those, including, you know, to some extent how Go is different. I mean, its packaging system uh, is one of those things that occasionally makes lawyers uh, tear their tear their uh, hairs out a little bit because it's not something so many of our lawyers, not our lawyers, well, our lawyers too, uh, but our licenses predate Go, right? They predate some modern language distribution practices. And sometimes that shows up. We wrote technology specific things for like C or C++ into our licenses. And then somebody says, well, how does that work in the case of Go? And the answer is, I have no idea. I guess those, those of you listening to this as a podcast can't see the face I just made. So just assume like perplexed, you know, search Giphy for your favorite perplexed GIF. And that, that was me just now. So yeah, so where do you all want to start with that? <laughs> I also have a kind of meta view of some of this because uh, I think similar to what you were going going the the line of thought you were going down where it's like okay well there's the the code that you've typed the thing that you've written but then there's like the knowledge of writing it and the idea of the thing and that's where like the API question is very interesting because it's like oh well someone else like if you retype the same code is that the same thing 
Or like, what if you type it slightly differently, but it's conceptually the same thing? Like, how far do you have to get away from, oh, this is like a sim, like how, how different does something have to be before it's like, okay, now someone else can own this thing. Uh, I remember over the years talking to lawyers about, um, you know, all the non-competes and things that we tend to have. And one of the things that lawyers consistently told me, at least in New York, is that like, uh, your employer has no right to the knowledge that you gain. So they can have ownership over the code that you write and the things that you produce, but they're not allowed to say, well, we gave you this knowledge, so you can't take it over there and use it against in one of our competitors. Um, I'd always find that very interesting as well, because it's like, oh, well, this is like another aspect of things. It's like, is an API knowledge or is it like the code that you've written or is it, so there's this really meta aspect to this, for me at least, to the whole idea of ownership. Oh yeah, I mean, absolutely, right? The, well, and by the way, you know, you specifically called out New York and Natalie said in pre-chat that when she wanted to ask about the EU, we as open source programmers, uh, and open source developers of various sorts tend to make an assumption that we can write a license that applies across the entire world. And in most law, that's like a completely laughable idea, right? Um, and they're like somewhere between laughable and like actively considered harmful. Uh, and so, you know, uh, we're sort of lucky in some ways that the core concept of copyright which is what applies to that actual written thing, distinct from the ideas, is actually a global standard. There's a, 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 a treaty called the Berne Convention that's 1908, maybe, 1903. So copyright has been standardized across the entire world for 100 years, which makes it a good platform for lawyers to build a global system on. If you're talking about databases, no global platform, no global legal platform. So writing a database license uh, is responsible for a lot of these gray hairs. Again, sorry, podcast listeners, you should watch it live next time. Um, the, uh, you know, and similarly with AI, you know, we don't know how some of this is going to play out. We, we can offer guesses. Uh, and frankly, they're very interesting guesses. It's a very fun theoretical game, but we don't know how it's going to play out in court. And by the way, Chris, I think the other meta thing that's really interesting for programmers, I often like to remind developers that writing a contract is like writing a code, is like writing code and then not executing it at all. And you just sort of are reading it and like we all agree more or less on what the output should be. But until it's actually been executed by, a, which happens through a court, right? A court says, this is what the thing is. Uh, then we don't actually know what the outcome is. So everything that I say here um, is going to be based on like a handful of things, right? Part of the challenge in Oracle v. Google is that we'd all been operating under these assumptions about what copyright law was, but there had been no litigation over what, whether or not an API could be copyrightable since the 80s. So the closest analogy we had was Lotus 123 drop-down menus. <laughs> and like uh, it turns out things have changed a lot since then um you know but because it hadn't been executed by a, by a court we really didn't know how this um was gonna be was gonna turn out uh and so that makes predictions this is why lawyers favorite phrase is it depends there's one thing i want to stick a pin in before we move on angelica and it's that idea that. of uh ai and I also want to call out code generation, and I really want to talk about that later because I think that's also like a very interesting thing when you, you know, the first thing you said was like, oh, who's typing the code at the end of the day? And that's how copyright is generated. So I just want to make sure we circle back to that later. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well. Um, I will say, one, for those of us who weren't following that Google law case uh, every step of the way, once it had been litigated, what was the conclusion? Well, so... Um, to take a step real quick back just to the very beginning, um, Oracle, well, Sun, had created Java. And uh, originally, the Apache project, sort of funded by IBM, had re-implemented Java. Complete clean room, um, you know, very strict, very effective clean room, as best as we could tell from the, from the pieces afterwards. Literally just a handful of lines, probably, uh, out of several hundred thousand in that re-implementation. Uh, that ended up looking like they were actually perhaps copied and pasted rather than uh, 
uh, a true clean room re-implementation. Uh, and so Google used that Apache re-implementation in their Android phones. And ultimately what happened after literally a decade of litigation, uh, I, I think I was on my fifth job by the time the case ended, like from when the case, actually six jobs from when the case started to when the case ended. Um, the case started with essentially um, Oracle claiming, there's some other stuff I'm going to leave out for simplicity, but uh, Oracle claimed that copying and re-implementing just the API headers was a copyright violation and that therefore all of Android should have to be licensed from Oracle for they originally asked for five billion. I think by the end of the case, they were asking for nine, 15 billion, something like that. Uh, the courts found essentially through a series of rulings over the years in this case, that a an API could be copyrightable independent of the implementation, uh, but there was a plausible, what we in the US call a fair use argument that essentially uh, if you re-implement in a way that's particularly transformative, right? Like you're doing something that is really different than what the original uh, authors or, or copyright owners of the API intended to do with the API, then uh, you have an argument that it's okay to, to, to reuse that API in that way through, through re-implementation. Lawyers like to say that fair use is simply the right to get sued. It's not, it's, it's ambiguous. It's one of these things where, again, you can't know ahead of time what the outcome is going to be. And that, of course, makes it a playground mostly for large companies, unfortunately, right? So I think in some ways that was not a great outcome. It was a better outcome for open source than what could have been, than what Oracle wanted to have. Uh, but it wasn't, an, it wasn't an ideal outcome. I want to ask one, one step back, kind of, when we talk about code ownership, what exactly does it mean? I own the code, whether I am an individual, a company or anything, does it mean I'm allowed to make money of it? Does it mean I can print it and hang it at home? Does it mean something else? You know, well, I'm going to give you my lawyer answer to that. Uh, those of you who whose GitHub accounts do things other than commit to other licenses, which is pretty much all I do these days. Um, with my GitHub account, we'll have better notions of code ownership as a cultural practice among programmers, right? Like who's responsible? I do want to talk a little bit about that one, but but let me put a pin in that and come back to it. The basic um, system since the at least the 60s in the US, I'm not sure exactly the timeline in the EU, but I would imagine similar, uh, is that, well, actually, let me go back even further. Creativity, uh, copyright is intended to protect creative works. So what do you have to do to get copyright in a thing? And I'll explain what copyright is in a second, but let me start with what it, uh, what you have to do. And what you have to do is you have to write down something that's creative. And write down can be broad, right? It can be sculpting or, but you have to take it out of your head and put it out into the real world in some way. That can be typing it in a computer, can be, like I said, sculpting it into a sculpture. Sculptures can get copyright. It can be a work of art. Um, you know, so it can be oil painting or whatever. Uh, it can be a Vim poster. Um, I mean, I'm a, honestly, these days, my development environment is Word, but I used to be an Emacs guy. Um, so that is the key thing is you are doing a creative thing and you're putting it in the, and can be mediated by tools. And Chris, this gets to your point about the, you know, AI and, and where is copyright in there, you know, it can be mediated by a typewriter or a paintbrush, or I believe that we don't really know for certain yet, it can be mediated by an AI, but you are doing some creative something and turning that into a fixed thing. All right. So what happens once you've done that? Um, actually, before I get into what happens once you've done that, because I think there's an important exception that's in the US at least, that creative, like, what does it mean to be creative is not zero. It's pretty close to zero, but it's not zero. There's an important case called Feist versus Rural Telephone, which, the, and the holding of that case is literally telephone books aren't creative. 
And so therefore they don't get copyright. Because what's the point of a telephone book? The point of a telephone book is to literally just mechanically go through a town and have phone numbers for everybody. So it's not, cre it's hard work, but it's not creative. And in the US at least, you have to have some kind of creative something. So if you do like a phone list of the 100 most awesome people in New York City, that's creative, right? You had to select one of the ways which you can be creative under U.S. copyright law is selection. So you, if you pick those 100 people, then, hey, you've done something creative. Your, your list of 100 people is copyrightable. But uh, if you're just every single person who lives in Manhattan, that's not creative. You don't get protection. And that plays into questions of databases and ultimately i think and we might not have time to get uh, time to get to this today but the question of the models themselves right because there's both uh the output of models what's the copyright on that and the models themselves we don't actually know if they're copyrightable that may be too esoteric might have to invite me back for another uh for for another one for that you know but okay so you've you've created this thing so now what do you do so now you've got copyright what does copyright let you do copyright lets you control what others can do with it right it lets you decide who gets to use it who gets to share who gets to redistribute it who gets to modify it within certain limits but it's pretty strong right so the limits include what's called first sale doctrine which is uh hey i sold it to somebody they can usually sell it to one other person first sale doctrine made a lot more sense in the era of like books and like that's what creates used bookstores is for sale doctrine. It means that I bought the copyrighted thing and now uh, I can give it to a used bookstore and they can resell it. Um, in the digital age, for sale doctrine is a little more complicated, um, but suffice to say, like that's one of the limitations. Similarly, fair use says, hey, if you're using this for education, if you're using this for nonprofit purposes, uh, I'm oversimplifying a little bit here. The tests around fair use can be a little complicated. Critically, in our digital age, uh, fair use in the U.S. has expanded quite a bit to include what's called transformative use, which is to say, hey, you're doing something super new, super different. Uh, the courts are often going to allow that in the name of sort of not impeding progress. So, for example, um, Google Book Search. Uh, is a is is in some sense the like the biggest copyright violation in all of history, right? Because it's literally copied systematically millions of books, uh, made these digital copies. But then uh, a court said, "Well, but actually, it's so different. It's so great." Um, and um, and they put strict controls around. You know, you can only get a few pages at a time, and authors can opt out if they want after the copying has been done. So, like Google Book Search is a good example of what transformation means, and and potentially analogous to what uh, to what Copilot is doing, right? But we don't know. I mean, the flip side of this, right, is that we just had court cases. We had a court case a couple of years ago. Uh, about the song Blurred Lines, some of you might have heard, right? And I, um, and courts there actually said that even just sort of copying the style of the artist could potentially be a copyright infringement, which was a, a big surprise to a lot of a uh, lot of lawyers. A lot of lawyers still unhappy about that case. Next week, there's going to be, or no, tomorrow morning actually maybe, uh, there's going to be a case about Andy Warhol. Um, doing uh and and a photograph of prince that andy warhol transformed into one of his andy warhol canvases and uh the supreme court like it's it's a little weird but i think that case might actually have a lot of impact on artificial intelligence because we've all done we've all played with stable diffusion or mid journey or open ai or whatever to create you know foo in the style of bar right well if bar is still alive and still has a valid copyright Maybe that's a problem. We don't really know yet. Um, I saw a research paper yesterday that said that if you do, uh, if you prompt Copilot to do code in the style of, forgetting the guy's name, Petrov, I think, a, a top Python programmer, that you will actually get fewer vulnerabilities in your code if you prompt Copilot with the name of a top maintainer and flip side the 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 paper's author was 
honest enough to note that they prompted with their own name and the number of vulnerabilities went up. That was <laughs> nice and humble of them. Uh, so style is an issue that's gonna that could potentially come up in code as well. That was a very long-winded answer to your question, Natalie. I apologize. No, that was interesting. So you said that for um, code ownership basically means who is allowed to sell and profit of that, who is allowed to give it their own interpretation. Yeah. And it's also who is yeah. who's there to answer in case of a problem, right? I wrote a piece of code that made my work lose a lot of money. Is that ownership on me? What? Yeah, I mean, so that's where it gets complicated. And, um, you know, we have really good answers for that in the case of things like if you manufactured a car wheel and the car wheel explodes and uh, because you used bad materials in that case, in the in the car wheel, um, like then, then we have some well-developed laws and intuitions around like okay well we sue the car wheel manufacturer um software doesn't have any of that really yet um uh, we've sort of operated in this rules free zone where everybody was like software's so cool i guess we'll just let it happen and um you know i think that age is coming to an end to be perfectly honest actually uh i i think um the the European Union has published in the past uh, year, including one last week, papers on liability for software. Right, I, the idea of you know if if a car wheel explodes and causes a car accident, we have a very clear idea of how we should figure out who is liable for that. If an if an AI goes wrong or software goes wrong and the car goes off the road and causes the exact same accident, we actually have very little idea um, how we should apportion liability, right? And it's not necessarily about, like that is, you know, for practical reasons, uh, those kinds of things tend to look the same, right? Because at the end of the day, the company that commissioned the code is also the company that sold the product. Uh, so you tend to see those things tied together, but there's no formal reason for that, right? Like copyright law doesn't, especially because copyright law historically was about like things that didn't cause car crashes, right? Historically copyright law, like literally modern copyright law in the US is in large part because of player pianos, right? Like little, like scrolling wheels, like what you saw in Westworld, like, you know, scrolling wheels with little punch holes that caused a piano to do things. Like pianos didn't run off and like kill people. So, uh, so copyright law doesn't really have much to say inherently about product liability. And that's something that we are, I think, screaming towards a very high velocity um, in, in, at least in the EU, and I suspect because of AI uh, in the US soon as well. I feel like there's an interesting component to that as well, because when you think about what we create, we're just creating words on a page. like the manufacturing process of turning that into something that does something is not necessarily something that the person who wrote the code does. So it's like something that somebody else does. And then there's all of the like, well, the machine you run it on, like if, if a bug does happen with like a car that's driving, is it the fault of the person who wrote the code? Is it the fault of the machine? Is there a problem with the machine? Who like, who gets the blame? And I think that gets extremely murky because we're dealing with such like, new stuff that we have never had in like the existence of humanity yeah i mean so so the the original history of this in like the english and u.s law systems was that literally like to, to get to that point where hey the car wheel explodes we should sue the car manufacturer uh involved a lot of people uh dying in train accidents and the train companies being like oh but that's not our fault we just laid the tracks bought the train bought the coal it's the guy who was driving it's their fault so you can't sue us and that actually like as a matter of law was like a good argument for decades and then the you know and then the number of accidents as trains became ever more present as part of our economy as part of simply how things moved around well the tech the technological change drove a change in understanding Right. Because that rule was originally from like, hey, some dude on a horse 
it's not my fault if I own if I you know if he's like my my squire or whatever pick your ancient British legal term uh, you know if they're out on my horse like genuinely it's sort of not my problem if they like caused an accident you know I mean yeah I own the horse but like uh, and so the train companies for a long time were like well look it's just like a horse this train is just like a horse I can't be responsible and so at some point the legal system was like actually this is ludicrous uh and so a combination of courts and and congress changed the rules to make the train companies more liable no surprise the trains then started getting safer uh and um you know we are yeah angelico i've actually got a british person on this uh podcast i believe so why am i not asking you the proper terms here yeah it's all it's um, the foot, footman's fault it's the footman's well that's exactly it right it's the footman's fault uh and so i think we're seeing we are is both an exciting and a terrifying time for lawyers that we are in the midst of one of these very rare technological changes, right? We are AI, I think in particular, is going to be that new train. Nobody really understands. Nobody wants to take responsibility for Chris, as you say, like super good reasons. This stuff is literally the most complicated systems ever built by humankind. We like, even in the best case, have only the vaguest sense of how it works. And like, and good luck explaining it to a judge. Like, I, I had a conversation with some lawyer friends last week that was like, how would you explain, and these are like fairly sophisticated, you know, like most either are programmers or one of the people is like married to a programmer. Like we're fairly, and we've been doing tech law all for, you know, cumulatively many decades. How would you explain machine learning to a judge? I, and we all just sort of stuttered in horror at that thought, right? Because it, it, it's a really... Again, I mean, even to other, even to programmers who haven't thought about it, it can be really hard, unintuitive. Uh, the vocabulary is changing all the time. The technology is changing all the time. You know, and, and to try to explain it to Congress <laughs> or to a judge um, is a, is a scary proposition. It's an exciting. Whoever gets to do it first, that's going to be a super great lawyer job for somebody. But also, like, boy, when you screw it up. Uh, you know, I mean, we felt a lot of pressure in the Google Oracle trial, right? Um, that this was something that if we got it wrong, it would really hurt open source. And I suspect, you know, every good lawyer, of course, cares about their client, but some clients are just represent one client and other clients represent these big systemic changes. And you feel that weight as a lawyer. I feel like there's a, an other side of the, the problem as well, because it's like if you if you try and assign blame to the person who like owns the copyright of code, there is a huge amount of code that we all depend on all the time that's maintained by like some random dude in Bra Nebraska, like individual people. And it's like, well, if you can sue to get to them because something they wrote caused some problem somewhere down the chain, then that's obviously a problem. Cause I, I can kind of see the chain where it's just like, well, who actually gets the blame for the bug that was written or the problem that happened with the code? You can easily just like keep tracing that back further and further and further and further by like passing on the blame. So it's like, once again, with the train, it's like, well, I didn't create that wheel. Someone else created that wheel. So that's their problem. Or like with the Spectre meltdown hardware problems where it's like, oh, well, it's not my fault there was a breach. The processor shouldn't have been speculatively executing. Like there's so many like weird arguments that you have because of this stuff that we don't really understand what it is right now. Yeah, and, and I think applying the old models is probably gonna get us some very bad outcomes. And unfortunately the way the legal system learns sometimes is by having bad outcomes. Everybody stubs their toe on it and then you, you sort of fix that up uh as we go but some people end up being caught in the middle you know that guy in nebraska i assume all the listeners here have seen the xkcd comic about the guy in nebraska um the problem is of course it's not even just one guy in nebraska it is a tower of ten thousand guys in nebraska and so you know i do want to talk a little bit about the day job here um and because uh so i i founded co-founded a company called tidelift and Tidelift's mission, as we said at the top of the show, is to make open source better for everyone, in part by paying the maintainers. Because what we're seeing happen all the time, we saw it happen a couple times this week just in the JavaScript community, is the solution to this kind of problem that you've identified, Chris, so far, is we'll just start applying standards, right? So like we've got the OpenSSF standard security scorecard, we've got salsa.dev, 
which is a different kind of security scorecard. Um, GitHub caused some controversy by saying, hey, we've identified the most popular, uh, I think only NPM for right now, um, projects, and we're sending you all a free two-factor authentication key. And also we're like mandatorily turning on two-factor authentication for everybody. And a couple maintainers for various reasons were just like, that's too much work. That's going to compliment, complicate my life. It's going to break my build scripts. And like, we can go back and forth about like whether or not uh, two-factor authentication in some of these cases is a good idea. But I want to step back. I mean, I generally think two-factor authentication is a good idea. Don't get me wrong. But like, that's the easy case. It just gets harder from there, right? Like, okay, well, what do we need to do to sign our binaries? Uh, you know, Go, I understand that's a mostly solved problem, like signing modules is a mostly solved problem in a lot of other language ecosystems, it is not. Um, and, you know, so, so okay, so there's extra work, right? Um, and we've just created this extra work, Chris, as you say, on some guy in Nebraska or actually a stack of 10,000 some guys. I apologize to listeners, it's probably grating for me to hear, uh, for me to say uh, 10,000 guys, but I think it's worth... Uh, both admitting that this is a problem and I think saying that this is the part of the problem of the gendering of open source is very much that uh, in a world where women are often called on to take on more than their share of household uh, duties and, uh, you know, home care, child care, elder care, if we're not paying people to do open source, well, guess what? That's part of how we get guys doing it because guys, for various cultured reasons, have more free time. Anyway. That's an important side note that I try to, uh, I think is important to say. Um, anyway, we're putting all these new requirements on people, Chris, because of exactly this intuition you've had about like, how do we, but we're doing nothing to make open source more fun, easier. Like all we're doing is, lo is loading more work on top. And I think at some point, uh, I think we're already starting to see it in some communities that the it, people are going to snap people are going to walk away people are going to say so what do we do so t what tidelift does to help address this problem is we say hey um we go to our customers and we say you're going to get more predictable more reliable open source if developers follow these standards they're not going to follow these standards on their own you should pay them so if you want the stuff you use to follow those standards write us a check we will go out, find those developers for you. Hopefully we already have a contract with them from other customers, but we'll go out, find them and pay them. Uh, and in order to get some of these this work done. Now, there's a lot of challenges around this, right? In part, because guess what? Nobody wants to pay for open source. It's all, it's it should be free. And like, well, guess what? If you're liable, all of a sudden, maybe it's not free. And I think one of the interesting things that we're going to see in discussion about these EU regulations, for example, they contain exceptions for open source, but they're just, they're, uh, um, their um, definition of open source s sort of looks like it excludes commercially sponsored open source, mm. which as we know is a lot of open source these days, right? Um, we don't know how that's going to play out. We don't know what it really means. Like their definition is vague enough that like, Maybe it only includes a small slice of open source, or maybe it includes a lot of open source. We don't really know yet. Um, yeah, I'm sure that's going to be lobbied over. Um, and in fact, I'm going to publish something hopefully uh, tomorrow or Thursday on Dev.2 about you know what open source developers can do to help uh, lobby the U.S. government on this topic. But a lot of the same things going to apply to the EU government as well. Yeah, I think one of the thoughts I had during during you know what you were saying is, and I, I I've expressed this in private to some people, and I always get kind of the like you've just said heresy uh, look or comments. Um, but I I have been wondering like is open source sustainable as the method of how we do things in this industry? Like is this like focus on sharing so much of code like? actually going to be something we can continue doing in the future since there's so much amb ambiguity around all of this. And, and quite frankly, I think it also just like atrophies uh, the, the, the whole industry because we're not, we're not rewriting things. We're not reimagining things. Like, I think that's one of the, the core problems with copyright in general, right? There's this whole thing that Disney has done where it's just like, copyright used to be like 20 years. Now it's like almost forever or as Disney would like to have it, 
actually forever. Um, so it's like, oh, well, now these things are just kind of sticking around and it's so much harder to like move things forward, right? It was like, if I, if I remember the, the kind of genesis of copyright or the vague genesis, it's like, we want to protect people, like make it so they can profit off of their creative work for some time, but then it goes back into the general pool of things so we can kind of continue making progress forward. Um, yeah, boy, that sustainability question is a big one, Chris, and I really don't know. I mean, I, I'd like to say that that we have a real clear answer to it. I mean, certainly, I think that Tidelift is part of uh, the answer to that, uh, but I think it's a really good question to be asking. And I, I, you know, that heresy, it is an elephant in the room that a lot of people, I got to say, I get a little frustrated when an employee of a trillion dollar company is like, I don't know, paying people... Open source seems to work fine for me. I'm like, well, yeah, because you literally work for a trillion dollar company. And, uh, but, you know, a lot of the software you rely on, and you're certainly that of your customers rely on, they don't have that luxury, right? Um, it is the kind of thing, um, you know, you got a puppy. Puppies are often more fun than replying to pull requests from automated bots. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, and Chris, I think it's, I think one of the interesting things we've been a little backward focused, but I think there's a lot of cool stuff. You know, I know we're, we're flying through this time. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting questions about this, you know, future looking around machine learning, uh, co-pilot, things like that. And part of those go to what you're saying, you know, Chris, you were saying, well, the original motivation for copyright was to, um, well, there's sort of three original cop motivations for copyright that vary depending on who you're talking to. So in the US, in the Constitution, it says that the purpose of copyright is to encourage authors, right? So it is a very utilitarian, like, we're going to give you this copyright, and as a result, you're going to, like, create more stuff, and every that's a bargain that we're going to have, right? Like, we're going to give you this monopoly, which otherwise the founders super against monopolies, but they created the copyright monopoly specifically in order for the rest of us to benefit from this incentive of a whole bunch of stuff being created. So that's one story. Uh, in the EU, uh, really, actually, most of the rest of the world except the U.S., uh, it's more like your your creativity is like a part of you like it is part of your like human your, your human nature is to create and so uh there's often what are called um moral rights the idea that inherently you have some control over the over the thing that you've created even if it's not productive right even if there's no social value to it and we are gonna like uh, we're going to be running headlong into that with all of the foo, you know, foo in the style of bar. Bar is going to be really irritated that their moral rights were infringed. And by the way, uh, you know, the third, like historic, the original copyright uh, was literally just basically a tool of censorship uh, for the UK government in the early 1600s. Um, they, it was a, it was a way for them to control printers, and. I think we're going to, you know, I think, Chris, there's a really interesting discussion we're going to have over um, how does open source probably won't be mediated through copyright, but as you were saying about liability and security, how how does government interact with this? Because it's one thing if, like, these big businesses are running around saying, like, hey, we should make this stuff more secure. It's very different if governments are running around saying the whole world needs you to be more more secure right like that's um you know big thing that we still haven't really wrapped our heads around yeah it also doesn't help that our uh, legislatures our legislators aren't very tech savvy and don't they tend to write a lot of laws that are, you're like I, this makes no sense um or ask questions in hearings that are uh, questionable at yeah. best yeah there's two parts of that right like that's the one and again I'll, I'll try to be quick here that's the one that everybody thinks about because we've seen our legislators on tv and it's terrifying but there's also this thing where like it used to be that the law then so so legislators sort of provide you like a rough draft right and then the courts are used to refine that but because legis because litigation has gotten so expensive and everybody hates it we don't do the refining of the rough drafts anymore mm. right like it, it sort of becomes industry convention and and that's a real, um, that sticks us with a lot of cruft um, that I think are, uh, that I think is a problem. Natalie, you had a question you wanted to 
Um, I wanted to say that uh, that's like a couple of topics back, but I had a, I'm a contractor, so I'm, I have clients around the world. I see all sorts of different contracts. And one time I had a contract with a California based company and there was a clause that said that any damage that I cause, I am responsible of it. And uh, so back to the conversation about that Nebraska person. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, contrast can say that. Um, the good news slash bad news is that you are probably what is known as a uh, uh, not a deep pocket, right? Like they're unlikely to sue you because what are you going to give them? Your, I mean, your collection of goldies would, um, uh, um, you know, would uh, not be not be through not you know not be worth much to them. Like so, the deep pocket. I was really the terrified. You exactly. For. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was very. I mean, you scary should, for me, you, you I, probably I should have negotiated that out. But that's one of these ways in which the legal system is very unbalanced, unfortunately. And that's a whole other mm -hmm. rant for a whole other show. Yeah. Especially the American one. But the thing is, some friends who work in California said that this is actually a normal clause that they had this in contracts in the past. Yeah, I think nobody from working in California is on this panel. So maybe somebody listening can keep me honest here. But I've been just told, yeah, don't worry. It's always there. Just don't take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of, well, there's a whole other thing about Cruft in, uh, again, an, another rant for another day. Uh, how lawyers deal with Cruft could learn a lot from how programmers deal with Cruft. Because uh, a lot of this stuff that is, um, you know, we don't have any sense of dependencies or module reuse or anything like that in law. And so you get uh, stuff that literally just gets copy pasted. Like imagine if you copy pasted all your code all the time, we as programmers know, of course that creates errors, right? And we have linters and dependencies and we have all that kind of stuff. Lawyers have none of that. And um, that is a problem. Though I, I am curious to see if machine learning helps us with that in the future mm. as lawyers. I was going to say that, like, when you were talking about how we have, like, the laws get written and then they don't get, you know, tested or refined. I'm like, that's kind of like writing code, but without test. And you're just kind of like, I don't know, it's just running out there and we have no idea if it's, like, doing the right thing or doing what we intended. We just, we just wrote it. There's no test frameworks. There's no linters. There's no, uh, you know, by the way, when you compile it, it will be... Uh, there will be somebody else trying to persuade the compiler to do things totally different from what you intended. Like it's um, it's a very adversarial uh, system that's not set up for robustness. It, I mean, it worked. Don't get me wrong; it works reasonably well in a lot of cases. In, but it's mostly because of humans. This was the one thing that drove me nuts about all the smart contract stuff. Like contracts only work because humans are around to smooth off the rough edges bridge the gaps like as soon as you start making contracts into code like it, it, you're just doomed to failure because of all the failure modes of code that don't that we as programmers know and that you know don't go away when you have contracts you just have a more forgiving at the end of the day execution environment because at the end of the day humans are in the loop in a way that they aren't with smart contracts and in the way they aren't with code yeah, I always I find it interesting how it also causes some like class problems as well. Like I have legal insurance, so every time I get a contract of any sort, I like send it to lawyers to review. I'm like, is any of this weird? Um, but also knowing that I can just like take a pen and just strike through anything I don't like in a contract. But so many people think that's like, oh no, I've gotten this thing. This is like set in stone, and I can't do any. I have to take it or leave it. And it's like that's not how that's not how this really works. Um, so like knowledge also makes it so the legal system's kind of like a little, a little bit more wonky than I think it would be otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and on the flip side, of course, uh, you know, especially in the U S Natalie, I think you're correct to say that this is less of a problem in the EU, though, definitely not unknown as a problem. Uh, you get, um, you get lawyers who end up working more defensively than they might otherwise. Uh, which create it because of because they're thinking of the person like you, Chris. <laughs> uh, and so there's so extra effort gets put in extra layers get put in. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But it does mean um, there were virtues to the days of the handshake deal. 
right? Uh, high trust environments versus low trust environments is, is a real thing in, uh, in law, uh, unfortunately, for better or for worse. And there's and it's absolutely there's all kinds of class and privilege, um, you know, issues around that. That again, another rant, another day. And as seems to be the case with every episode we do, Natalie, we're going to have to get you back for a for a part two to go deeper dive. Um, I have one more question that I want to dive into before we go to kind of the unpopular opinion section, which is, and you alluded to the. Are there specific considerations when we're talking about Go? I know you talked about kind of package management, but what are the specific, I guess, legal areas when it comes to ownership of code that are brought in specific to the Go software engineering language? You know, I think there's one, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm getting a little over my skis here, but, uh, but Go is very much a, um, because of the way that you all have done packaging, it has some real implications, I think, for it, it breaks the brain of a lot of people who come out of like other language package managers, right? And it has some stuff that really made sense internally to Google. Uh, but once you start, there's this real question, Chris, you were alluding to it earlier, the, the guy in Nebraska, XKCD, Go wants to, my impression of it from an outside perspective, is that Go wants to make some of that not a problem by like, oh, well, we'll just, you know, grab this specific revision from this specific repo and voila, like, we know exactly what this code is. And and that guy in Nebraska can't hurt us anymore, right? He, he can't upgrade because we know exactly what it is that we've got here. But of course, that's ends up being a sort of adversarial relationship with that person, right? It means that when that person brings knowledge to the table, brings new versions to the table, there's this sort of assumption. We never really got to it here, Natalie, but I think there's this penumbra of, it's not ownership, but it's sort of entitlement almost, right? And this is certainly not Go specific, but this sense of like, well, I'm using it. And so I'm going to treat it a little bit like I have a support contract, like traditional software. And in fact, open source has sort of encouraged this because people, it, it started from this very collaborative community-based culture. And so the norms are like, hey, I'm going to help everybody who shows up in my issue tracker. And of course, at some point you get too popular and that breaks. But we haven't really acknowledged that that's, I mean, literally the word entitlement comes out of some of the same roots of like the same Latin legal roots as ownership. Like, you know, when you own a thing, you are entitled to do X. And we end up with entitlements uh, without the ownership part, without the payments part, without the labor part. And that really is what sends a lot of things sideways, I think, in open source. That's, again, that's where Tidelift comes in. And, um, you know, I think also, uh, you know, Go, I think, has tried to cabin some of that off with its module ownership. But sometimes that where that makes technical sense, it may not always make social sense. Um, and, you know, with more time, some other time, that would be a fun conversation to have in more depth with, with some of the folks who know more on the packaging side than I do, that's for sure. So, um, you know, I guess the, 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 the unpopular part is not go specific, but that's <laughs> definitely the uh, responsibility lies with all of us because we specifically decided in open source that, well, I'm not owning this thing in like some sense, but we very much decided in other senses that like we, we just, we sort of decided like one way of putting it is we decided that use of the code translates into ownership of somebody else's time. And like, that is not that when open source runs the entire world, which it really does at this point, that, that doesn't scale and we don't know yet chris to your to your earlier point of of heresy we don't know how that's going to continue scaling we don't know you know what happens when we ask everybody to do really complicated multi-factor signatures on everything like you know nobody hate no well with very few exceptions people don't hate this stuff they're software developers like they know security matters they know signatures help uh but they also know they've only got so much time in the world and sometimes they come home from work and they really just want to pitch their laptop into the lake and that does not help you close out your issues if you've pitched your laptop into the lake right so we're gonna have to figure that out <laughs>
might involve buying some people some laptops or maybe writing them a check or maybe it'll involve helping them with AI, which we really didn't get to at all. But again, maybe next time. Yeah. So there, there is a I remember a conversation that happened, I think, among a, a smaller group of people within the community. But when modules were were being designed and developed, one of the comments that kept coming up was like, this is biasing toward the consumer instead of the, you know, the provider, the maintainer. And is that a thing we really want to do in the Go community? And what effect is that going to have on people's ability to actually maintain and build open source things? And I think, I think we're really starting to see some of the outcomes of that with like what Ben Johnson's been doing, where he's just like, I don't want contributions. I don't want like, I, there's just, I don't have enough bandwidth to, to kind of deal with some of these things. And I think we're going to see a lot more people that just are like, well, I can't, like if there is a bug and now I, I have almost no recourse to fix it or I can't get people off old versions of things or I can't, and that, that does kind of erode the ability of people to, to do open source really, which erodes our ability to you know, maintain the modern world in a sense. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, that's one thing I would say to the Go folks, uh, that is not, you're not alone in that. Every ecosystem is struggling with that. There are different flavors caused by different technical choices and different cultural choices along the way. But the core problem, I can't wait. We did a Tidelift conference pandemic. I can't wait to do our next one because very much a theme is going to be how can people across many language ecosystems uh, share notes, <laughs> you know, figure out what this looks like uh, because it's very much not, um, if you feel alone, when you're if you're having a bad day and you want to chuck uh, your private keys away and never log into GitHub again, like you're not alone in that. Uh, that is a that is a common thing, right? And um, and GitHub is gonna bust their butts. I, I will give them credit. They're trying to do a lot to um, uh, to to make some of this easier for maintainers. But ultimately, Chris, as you say, big companies are gonna bias towards doing the right thing for the consumer. Right, like Microsoft has done a lot of amazing things for the open source community, which 1997 me is like aghast that I'm saying that out loud, but like it's very real. And uh, you know, but at the end of the day, I mean, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, when it comes down to push or shove, the decisions are often going to be made in favor of the consumer, and and we do need to have the, some of those honest discussions about what that looks like because it's not because Natalie the to get to get back to some of what you're saying and, and the overall theme of the show legal ownership is only part of the story here cultural ownership responsibility entitlement all these things are related to but cannot be solved just by our legal systems right like i and i think maybe that's my one regret i have very very few regrets about going to law school it was a lot of fun i met a lot of great people but um People often come to me seeking legal solutions for what are ultimately cultural problems. And I can only do, um, you, the best lawyers know how to straddle that gap, right? Uh, and I like to think that that is certainly my biggest strength as a lawyer, especially in this space, is how to straddle that gap. Uh, but it's not, it's not easy. Which actually, by the way, reminds me, side project, fun project, and, and then we'll, we'll leave it. I know we're running out of time here. Uh, I am writing a newsletter called openml.fyi. Uh, it is new. I literally sort of launched it to some friends a couple weeks ago and more broadly yesterday, but is literally about these questions of how open and machine learning uh, overlap, uh, which includes questions like, is this the end of no warranties? Uh, because every open source license, as you pointed out, Chris, has like big all caps text that says no warranties. If you break it, you buy it. And what does that mean in light of EU regulation? Um, you know, be talking about a lot of this stuff like Copilot there as well. So would love to have you all back. But for those of you who are curious about that topic, um, it's a ghost um, AGPL powered newsletter, openml.fyi. So we'll add it in the show notes. Yeah, cool. I want, I want to end with like, because I know we got to get to unpopular opinions, but I just want to say like, one of the things I always think about when, uh, when we get into these conversations is like, people tend to think like, humans are like transactional, and they're like, kind of mean to each other, and we want a war and all of that. And I feel like the existence of open source and the existence of our industry as a whole proves that people are a lot of times selfless and will sacrifice a lot just to make other people feel good, just for the happiness of other people. Uh, and I think that's like shows how like incredible and how collaborative we are as as a species. 
Um, and I think more of us need to, to remember that, uh, especially in, in the times we are now. We are not necessarily this always angry at each other, always warring, always territorial species. Quite often, most of us are just like these, you know, we just want to help our fellow people out. It's been too long since I worked at Wikipedia, but um, the amount of, I mean, here's this thing, it's this amazing cultural treasure and anyone can go and graffiti on it at any time. And like something like one in a thousand edits are spam, right? Like, I mean, think about what that says as like, to exactly your point, Chris, right? Like, actually, most of the time, most people, we all want to make this work right <laughs> um and like and and open source open data um are very much i think like genuinely amazing it's, it's why i enjoy doing it right like there are a lot more lucrative things probably all of us could be doing with our lives but like um but yeah it's human and humane in a, in a great way lovely note to end the episode we're gonna have to get you back for a part two for sure but before we let you go we're gonna be doing a little bit of unpopular opinions i actually think you should probably leave What is your go time on popular opinion? Oh boy. I, I mean, I think I already really, uh, I mean, the one I have in the show notes is absolutely the one I already nailed, which is, hey, uh, we should all be paying for this, right? We got it for free for a long time. And uh, that that train is, is running out for very human, decent reasons, right? Like it's not like I think companies are bad for having used this stuff, um, but yeah, it, Chris, as Chris was saying, sometimes you raise that employee company. I, I, I will never forget. I So there was this project that I was invited to like, yeah, come to a meeting about, right? I won't be specific, but it was one of many, 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 many metadata, open source metadata projects. And people went on for like about 45, 50 minutes. And I was like, okay, but why are volunteers going to create all this metadata for you? Quiet, silence, quiet, silence. Okay, but why? What's their motivation? I don't know. It's probably just going to happen. Needless to say, that project is uh, has not really gone much of anywhere. Um, you know, and, and but it but I was treated as like a pariah and like literally not invited to future meetings for a while because I had dared to ask this like question of why would people do this, and I I think. I, I unfortunately I still get that all too often. I, I think, to be fair, lots of people are getting the message finally, but it's taken longer than it should have. That's my sadly unpopular opinion today. It's like that meme about that guy that's being thrown outside of the window. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, which thrown outside of the window? I got now. I gotta Google this. Where it's like, like they're all in the meeting. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Yep. Been there. Been that guy. Intrigued to see how uh, unpopular or, in fact, popular that opinion is. And then I want to ask you, Chris, for an unpopular opinion, given that we're just getting you back. And I'm sure you oh. have something on your mind. You always do. I have so many unpopular opinions. <laughs> um, let me think of a good one. Let me let me, let me sort through my brain. Um, I don't think this is going to be unpopular. So I think most people probably agree. But it's like a thing I want to put out into the universe more. Uh, and that is that every tech company larger than probably 20 or 30 people should hire a librarian. We create ridiculous amounts of information but then we usually just dump it into a wiki and then we're like, we'll be able to find it. Just use the search functionality or we like try and make a docs page and we're like, users will be able to find stuff. And it's like, there's an actual degree program of people who like get doctorates and how to arrange information so people can find it, like go hire them. Like, 
It's not you don't even have to they, like they're not even that expensive to hire. Like just go to, to go get a couple. Like you'll get a librarian and archivist and then make your data and your information just much more clean and much more organized. Uh, it will probably help you make a lot more money in the long run and make your engineers less frustrated with the world. How come not all database companies in Google and so on hiring librarians and archivists to do this? I don't, I, I'm, I'm assuming people don't hire librarians because they just never, I, A, I think most people don't know what librarians actually do. I think most people just think librarians are the people that like can help you find books in the library and they don't think much more about that. They don't, they don't think about like the, but how do they help you find the books? <laughs> They're just like, yeah, they just, they just help me find stuff. Um, so we think that's part of it. And it's just like, a, unless you're, unless you sit down and think about what the problem is, I don't think it, like, it's like that kind of clear thing. You're not going to look necessarily outside of the world you exist in. You're going to be like, oh no, this is the world. Like, you know, we can do this with computers. We can just write some code that'll do some indexing and that'll work. Um, like I always look at books and I always look at like the indexes they have and I'm like, someone is trained, probably has like a high level degree in how to actually pick what words go in an index. And that's like a really challenging job because there's a crap load of words in a book. And you're like, well, which ones do I pick and put in that index? It's like, well, no, that's like a hard job. And yet books forever, well, not maybe forever, forever, but for a very long time have been, had indexes. And it's like, well, we should probably get those people. Um, but yeah, I think most of the time it's like, we as technologists are just like, no, 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 our, our technology will just do it for us. We'll write some stat stuff or some ML or AI or whatever. And it can obviously replace the thing that humans have been doing very well for a very long time, even though we have no idea about that, you know, degree program or industry is at all, you know, typical things that we do. The, the, the times published a book review yesterday of a, a book on the history of indexes, um, which apparently has like three separate. Nexus, so uh, it, it looks really interesting. And I promise I did not tee that up. It's not over. <laughs> <laughs> Company fab. Yeah, the New York Times actually does some really good work. <laughs> <laughs> I genuinely forgot that. Uh, genuinely forgot that there. I'll drop your check off later. Um, <laughs> just a, just a dis discount on my subscription. That's all I ask. <laughs> we'll, so, we'll, we'll, we'll chat. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. It's also wonderful to have you back, Chris, and wonderful as always to have mm -hmm. you kind of co-presenting with me, Natalie. And regrettably, we're now gonna have to say goodbye. So thank you all, and hoping to have everyone together again soon for another Go Time episode. Mm -hmm.